Everybody's calling me now. Come on now. Did we restart the live stream? There we go. We're, we're, we're working now. Is it on? Yeah, it's we're working. And you got sound? For now. All right, we're back on and we got sound. We're live streaming, so uh, we're going to keep an eye on it, make sure it continues to work. Um, am I good in the picture? Yeah, I got you all straight now. Okay. All right. So hopefully you reconnect. Is everybody reconnecting? Can we see what's going on? Everybody reconnecting? We got a few people in right now. Yep, they're coming. All right, give everybody a chance to reconnect. And we're gonna wait for just a second for everybody to reconnect. Uh, I'll do another, I'll do another trivia question while we're waiting because Pastor Kerry only wanted to do five trivia questions, so I, I will do another trivia question while we're waiting. Let me think of a good one for Easter. Um, I can ask. Well, never mind. Hmm. Nah, that's not that's not factual. I want something factual for an Easter question. All right, um, another good Easter question. When when uh, Jesus appeared to the disciples, one of the disciples was missing the first time he appeared, and this disciple, when they all told him that they saw Jesus resurrected. He said that he would not believe till he put his fingers in the wounds and his hand in Jesus' side where the spear went into him. So this was one of the 12 disciples. Was it Peter? Was it Matthew? Was it um, Thomas? Or was it Judas? Which one was it? Was it Peter A, Matthew B, Thomas C, or Judas D? Which one of the disciples was it? We had a couple people say Thomas. Okay. Maria, Robin, and Bunny. Yes, it was Thomas. Good job. That's where we get the term doubting Thomas from. Don't be a doubting Thomas. That's where that term comes from if you've ever heard that. You know, the interesting thing my whole life growing up, um, my grandma used to always say, don't be a doubting Thomas. And I had no idea that was a biblical statement until I got born again and started studying the word of God. So you may not have known that's where it came from either, but I had no idea that that's where that term came from. Yeah, Thomas doubted and Jesus appeared to Thomas and, and the 12 again. And Jesus told him to put his fingers in his hands and to put his hand in his side where the spear penetrated. And then um, he said that we would be more blessed than Thomas because we believe and don't see. Thomas was, was blessed because he saw and believed. And he said how much more we will be blessed because we don't see yet still believe. So you get an extra blessing because you believe in Jesus and you're not seeing. So praise God. So I think we got everybody tuned back in now and we're ready to start. So I apologize for that technical difficulty with everybody live streaming. Facebook's bandwidth is like totally eaten up and, and their servers aren't able to handle it. So we ran into a technical difficulty and we thank you for bearing with that, with uh, what's going on with everybody streaming on Facebook this morning. So my message is he is risen. I'm excited to share this message with you. It's going to be more of a teaching. Uh, like I had said, I'm doing more of a, a sit down teaching while we're doing this because it's hard to preach to an empty church. So I'm going to do a little bit more teaching. And um, this is going to be an opportunity for us to all check ourselves and to make sure we truly are born again. Uh, if, if we're lacking the evidence of a relationship with Jesus Christ, which I'll get into in the message, there's no better time than today, Easter Sunday, to rededicate your life to Jesus and to lay hold of the promises of the cross and, and to have a relationship once again with, with God the Father and uh, the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ, the Trinity. So um, I'm going to ask everybody to, to listen to this message. There's going to be a lot of scripture. 
and, and evaluate your relationship with Jesus Christ as we go through this and see if you are truly born again. God doesn't want us to wonder about it. He wants us to truly know. And that's one of the saddest things I run into as a pastor. Um, you know, I'll be, I'll be um, counseling some people or talking to people or just meeting people and, and I'll make a comment, praise God. You know, we get to go home and be with the Lord and, and you know, I'll ask them, are they born again or do they have that confidence? And, and, and more often than not, what I hear is I think so, or I believe so, or I hope so, or, you know, I think I'm good. And, you know, the word of God is clear. God doesn't want us to think or hope. He wants us to know, to know that we are born again. And you can know, and there's proof that's given to you to show you that you can know. So we're going to talk about that this Resurrection Sunday. Um, Matthew 28, 6 says, He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. This is the angel that came down and rolled away the big stone. If you'll recall Mary and the other Mary, when she, they were walking to the tomb on Sunday morning to finish preparing the body because uh, sunset came and they weren't able to finish preparing the body with all the spices and then they ran into a Sabbath on Saturday and then and then uh, Sunday was the first day that they would be able to go and actually prepare finish preparing Jesus's body and they were talking about who's going to roll away the stone and who's going to move it for us and there were Roman guards there but the chances of them moving that stone were were, were non-existent because it had been sealed with Pilate's seal so that people wouldn't break in and rob Jesus' body out of it. And um, so it was sealed and under heavy guard and this angel shows up and, and sits on top of the stone and there's an earthquake when this angel comes down and sits on the stone. The whole earth shook, there was an earthquake. And the word of God says that all the guards that were guarding Jesus' tomb were literally slain in the spirit. They were blown back by the presence of the angel and they fell backwards and, and were knocked down by the presence of God. And, and Mary uh, Magdalene and the other Mary is there and, and the angel speaks to them and tells them, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he laid. And they, they look in the tomb and they see that Jesus' body is gone. And, and this is just an amazing event that takes place. And then they go back and they tell the other disciples what they had seen and witnessed. We serve a living God. He's not dead. He's not on the cross. He's not buried in a tomb. He is alive. He has been resurrected. And there's overwhelming evidence of that resurrection. And we're going to talk a little bit about that evidence this morning. And I'm going to show you inside the Word of God and outside of the Word of God where it clearly states that he was resurrected and this was witnessed by multitudes of people. All right, so there is overwhelming proof of the resurrection. And let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. This is Paul talking to the church at Corinth and he's talking about this overwhelming evidence and how important it is to understand and believe that Jesus Christ has been risen. You have to understand and lay hold of that and believe in the resurrection. That's the key to your entire salvation. You must believe in the resurrection. And Paul lays that out here in 1 Corinthians 15 through 3. Right? It says, for I receive, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. So he opens up this scripture with this is the most important thing. Number one, it's of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now here's something most people don't get. They think this is talking about New Testament scriptures, but the New Testament hasn't been written yet. What Paul is talking about is the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament that said Jesus Christ was going to come, he was going to be born of a virgin, that he was going to live his life, he was going to die on a cross, and he was going to atone for our sins, and that he is the Messiah. There's over 300 prophecies about Jesus coming and being the Messiah, and all 300 of them have been fulfilled. Now, we talked about previously in messages that I preach that just eight, the top eight prophecies about Jesus coming and the ones that deal with his death and resurrection, just eight of those, the likelihood of those eight being fulfilled by one man 
are astronomical. And he fulfilled 300, over 300 prophecies. And just those eight were the equivalent of filling the state of Texas with silver dollars to three feet deep. And then you walking into those silver dollars and pulling out one that had been marked in the entire state. Those are the odds that Jesus would fulfill eight prophecies. And yet he fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. These are the scriptures Paul's talking about because portions of the New Testament had been penned, but very few in the Bible hadn't been put together yet and totally circulated to the church. So he's referencing these Old Testament scriptures. He said that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Verse four, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. It was prophesied that he would raise, be raised from the dead. Verse five, and that he appeared to uh, Cephas first, and, and that's Peter, that's Peter, all right? And then to the 12, that's the rest of the disciples, in verse 6, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, this is important because Paul's writing his letter, and some of the people in this church have seen Jesus in his resurrected, glorified body. And he's saying most of these 500 people that witnessed Jesus Christ in his glorified, resurrected body are here. They're still alive today and they could bear witness if I was lying or not telling the truth. They've seen it. They are firsthand witnesses to what had happened. Yet none of them refuted what Paul was writing. All right. So they bore witness to it and they saw it. most of them were still alive when the New Testament was being written. So if there was error in it, they would have corrected that error. There's no error in it because it's, it's breathed by God. The inerrancy of the word, it is 100% true. All right. Verse seven, then he appeared to James, that's his brother. And then he appeared uh, to all the apostles. And then verse eight, and least of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. And what Paul's talking about is his bearing again experience was very different. And we know that from scripture, it happened on the road to Damascus where he was struck blind. Um, and he heard this, this sound, this overwhelming sound and this light. And then Jesus literally spoke to him and had this conversation with him about why are you persecuting me? And Saul became born again at that moment. And three days later, he had his hands laid on, uh, laid on him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So um, he was one abnormally born compared to the other ones. See, the other ones were all born again when they met in the upper room or not in the upper room. When they met, um, Jesus appeared to them for the very first time. And Jesus breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the moment they got born again. That's when the disciples were born again. See, they're going to be born again until after the resurrection. So when Jesus appeared the first time after the resurrection, that's the moment they, the apostles and, and disciples, got born again. And then later on, Paul gets born again. So that's why he says this one abnormally born. So the evidence that Christ was raised from the dead is overwhelming. Not just in the scriptures. It's recorded throughout the Old Testament what was going to happen. Then Jesus fulfills that and the odds of that are, are, are impossible. But yet he, he did it. He fulfilled all that scripture. And, and, and that's all recorded in the New Testament, which is an historical account of what happened. But then also it's recorded outside of the Bible. Most people don't know this and they don't understand it. But it is recorded in a tremendous amount of places outside of the word of God. Josephus, the, the New Testament, or sorry, the, the first century Jewish historian recorded it in many of his writings in great detail who Jesus Christ was and what happened and, and how Jesus taught and he was resurrected and what took place. So Josephus was a historian who lived in the first century and he recorded the events that went on outside of the Bible. There's also Greek historians who recorded it in great detail and the things that happened on the cross in that day. So it's recorded in Greek history. It's also recorded in Persian history. This one is amazing to me. 
And it was a Persian philosopher who recorded it down because he wanted his son to know who Jesus Christ was and the following generations that came behind him to know who Jesus Christ was. And he records historically all these events also. And you can Google these and have access to them. And one of my favorite is even Pontius Pilate gave testimony to Tiberius in a letter, letter that was written to him that recorded the events that took place on this day. That letter, believe it or not, is in the Library of Congress. And you can Google that in the Library of Congress. Pastor Kerry shared it with most of the congregation. If you're in our ministry school, it's part of the ministry school teaching. Um, so you have access to that letter and you can read it. And that's just an extra biblical proof. It's outside of the word of God that Jesus Christ lived. He walked this earth and he was resurrected. So there's all this proof. And in that proof, it talks about the three hours of darkness that occurred from noon till three in the afternoon. It talks about the massive earthquake that took place when Jesus gave up his spirit. Remember, nobody killed Jesus. He gave up his life. He said it is finished and he gave up the spirit. Um, so he laid his life down voluntarily. And this massive earthquake took place and the temple bell was rent and torn in half. And there's evidence of that outside of the Bible as well as inside of the historical recordings in the Bible. Um, there's also dead coming out of the grave during the resurrection. This is on Sunday when Jesus was resurrected. Dead people came out of the grave. It doesn't specifically say who, but what I believe occurred was, of course, we know Jesus spent three days in, in hell in the belly of the earth. And he went to Abraham's bosom, which was in hell at the time. It was a holding place, paradise. It was a nice place. That's where the thief on the cross went with him. When the thief on the cross believed, he said, surely I'll see you in paradise tonight. And he was with him in paradise. And this is where all the saints were waiting for the atonement that needed to take place. For, for Jesus' blood to be shed for all of history's sins, past, present, and future. And the resurrection is proof of the exception of that sacrifice by God the Father. He, Jesus was raised from the dead to prove that that sacrifice was sufficient. And it shows the acceptance of Jesus Christ as the spotless lamb who laid down his life and paid for our sins. This is why the resurrection is so important. All right. So um, the, the, the day Jesus was resurrected, there were reports in Jerusalem of dead people coming out of the graves and walking all over the place and testifying about what had happened. Now, some pastors and theologians think these were Old Testament prophets and Old Testament kings and, and prominent people in the Old Testament. I, however, don't believe that because all the people that were there would have not recognized them and not known who they were. I think it's more likely that they were those individuals' parents or grandparents or uncles or aunts or people that they knew and people in the area knew who came and testified because then they would know, hey, you're dead. What are you doing walking around testifying? If it was just an Old Testament prophet, they could assume it's just somebody who was alive all along. So these dead people came out and testified, and I think the Bible clearly states that the individuals they testified to knew who they were. So, um, and then also, um, Jesus appears in his resurrected body multiple times. And according to this account in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 8, he appeared to over 500 people at one time. So lots of people saw Jesus walking around in his resurrected, glorified body. It is a historical fact. It is a historical fact. There is more proof in writing, documenting that Jesus Christ lived, was crucified, and was raised from the dead than there is that George Washington was president of the United States. Now, that's a bold statement, but it has been documented and proven. We all know George Washington was president. We don't, we don't question that. We know who he is. There's historical data on him that's been proven to be accurate. But yet, for some reason, people don't believe the very same um, standards that were used to prove that, prove that Jesus Christ is alive uh, and was resurrected. And the historical documentation for that has been proven. Pastor Kerry preached a whole message on that. You may want to go back and watch it or listen to it, but she gave a detailed explanation of how that information was proven to be true. So it is a fact 
that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Why is that important? The reason why that is so important is because the resurrection is key to everything. The resurrection is key to everything. You see, if he had not been raised from the dead, then the sacrifice that was made would not have been accepted from, by God. The resurrection is proof that Jesus died once and for all for every sin, past, present, and future, and that that atonement for sin was sufficient and accepted by God. The resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection, and it is proof that Jesus paid the ultimate price. The resurrection is key to everything. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 25. I told you we were going to cover a lot of scripture. So turn with me there to 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 25. And we're going to start in verse 12. But if it is preached, this is important. This is why we must preach the resurrection. We must believe in the resurrection. And we must understand what the resurrection of Jesus Christ was all about. So this is Paul speaking. But if it is preached that Christ has been risen from the dead, how can someone, some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So, so you're double talking. You can't say there's no resurrection of the dead and preach that Jesus has been raised from the dead. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. That makes logical sense, right? And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. Man, there's a bold statement by Paul. He's saying this because there were new believers who were Sadducees, and Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And, and he's speaking to these people who are passing around this false teaching that there's no resurrection. So he's dealing with false teaching in the, in the body of Christ, something we still deal with today. So he's, Paul's addressing Resurrection is key. It's key to everything that's going on. And our preaching is useless, useless. And so is our faith if we do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 15. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he has raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. So we're preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what Paul's telling all these individuals. But if you're going around saying there's no resurrection, you're lying because Jesus was raised from the dead. Verse 16. For if the dead are not risen, then Christ has not been risen either. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. Let me read that again. Your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you don't understand God raised him from the dead, there's no atonement paid for your sin and you're still walking around in sin, which means you're still separated from God, which means you are not born again. So if you do not believe in the resurrection, you're not born again. It's impossible is what Paul's saying. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. That's a bold statement. What Paul is saying here is everybody who died from Adam until the time he wrote this letter, everybody who had passed away for basically the first 4,000 years of the earth's existence, that were waiting for the Messiah to come and had faith and hope that God would bring this Messiah to deliver them and set things straight once again. So we're talking about Adam, we're talking about Noah, we're talking about Abraham, the patriarchs. All the patriarchs that died and were in Abraham's bosom. We're talking about all those who died under the law. We're talking about Moses. We're talking about King David. We're talking about all the prophets, all the judges, all those who believed in Jesus Christ and that, that God would send his Messiah. See, they didn't know who the Messiah was. They didn't know it was Jesus at that point in time, but they believed, they believed that God would send a Messiah, and through that Messiah, he would set things right. So their faith and hope was in the coming Messiah. And because of that, they were in Abraham's bosom, waiting for the Messiah to come and make final atonement for their sin. And then also, all the saints who died in the church age, 
This is in the early church age, and by this time, James had already been killed, John's brother, uh, John the Baptist. All these people who died in the early church age um, would be lost, is what Paul's saying. And then we can extend that over the last 2,000 years, all the way to now. All the great preachers and men of God who have died would be lost. You could say Martin Luther. Um, you could say Billy Graham. You could say all these saints that had previously come, John Wesley, and all these guys who, who preached the word of God, Billy Sunday. All these individuals are lost. So basically, everybody from Adam till now is lost if the resurrection is not true. Their sin has not been atoned for, and they are dead, and there's no hope for them. Do you understand how important the resurrection is? This is what Paul is laying out. Verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Wait a minute. I thought the church says all you have to do is believe in Jesus. I thought the church says all you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus and it's going to be okay. But he says here in verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, if you don't believe in the resurrection, and if you don't believe in a resurrected Jesus, if you don't believe in a Jesus that's alive, seated at the right hand of the Father right now, if you don't believe in a Jesus who's going to come back, if you don't believe in a Jesus that's going to set all things right, if you don't believe in Jesus who's going to deal with all evil and put all of his enemies under his feet, if you don't believe in that Jesus, in that Jesus, you have no hope. You have no hope at all. Paul clearly states that it is not enough to just believe in Jesus that he existed. You have to believe in the resurrection. You have to believe that, that God accepted him as that sacrifice and believe in the resurrection. I'm going to give you some scripture to back that up in a moment. But I want you to understand, you have to believe God raised Jesus from the dead. That is the key. Verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's the first fruits of the resurrection. Those who have fallen asleep, it's talking about those patriarchs and those under the law and the early church. Those I had already talked about. He's the first fruit of all those who are going to be raised from the dead. And when we die and go home and be with the Lord, we'll be in spirit form in heaven till he comes back. And when he comes back, we will be raised from the dead and given a resurrected, glorified body. Verse 21. For since death came through a man, and here he's talking about Adam. Because Adam sinned and ate from the tree the knowledge of good and evil, original sin entered in and his spirit immediately died. If you eat from this tree, surely you will die. And that death has been passed on to every person who's ever lived. So if you're born and you were alive in the flesh, you had a dead spirit. Every person has a dead spirit. The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, through Jesus, the second Adam. So the first Adam sinned and every man died, their spirit died. Life comes through Jesus and believing in him and believing in the resurrection. And through believing in him and believing in the resurrection, you are given a new spirit. That's what it means to be born again. We're going to dig into that in a minute. For as Adam, for in Adam all died. So there he clarifies it. So in Christ all will be made alive. Through Jesus you will be resurrected. Verse 23. But each in turn, Christ is the first fruits. He's the first to be resurrected. And because he's resurrected, that's our blessed assurance. We're going to be resurrected. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him. So, after Jesus comes back, all of us will be resurrected. That's how we know we will be resurrected and live on this earth forever. Verse 24. Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. So, this is when... We enter into eternity and the kingdom's handed over to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. What's that talking about, all dominion and authority and power? He's destroyed Satan and the demonic spirits that are, 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 are ravaging this earth right now, the sin that's ravaging this earth right now, the fallen angels, the principality and powers of the air that are ravaging this earth right now. He's going to come back and have victory over all of them. He will defeat all dominion, authority, and power. All evil will be destroyed. 
for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. Those are all enemies of God. And he's going to put them all under his feet. The last enemy to do, be destroyed is death. Guys, death is real. It's real. And, and the depictions of the grim reaper or the angel of death are more accurate than, than most of us believe or give credit to. Death is a real thing. And it is the last thing that's going to be destroyed. And then we're going to go into eternity. We'll have eternal life and there will be no more death, no more evil, no more sin consciousness, no more sin nature, no more sin. And we will spend eternity with God. Man, what a day. What a day that's going to be. All right. So God's last enemy will be destroyed. His last enemy is death. The resurrection is God the Father accepting Christ's payment for his death his redemptive work on the cross for our sins. Every sin. Every sin ever done. Past, present, or future. Every sin that will ever be done till Jesus comes back. All those sins were atoned for. You see, under the law, they would sacrifice a boar or goat. And this is why people were in Abraham's bosom waiting for this payment to be made. The good people in the age of the patriarchs and under the law, the people who believed in a coming Messiah, because all salvation is by belief. And they believed in a coming Messiah. And belief is faith in Jesus Christ. All salvation is through faith that God's going to make it right. So they're in Abraham's bosom waiting, and Jesus dies on the cross. He goes to hell. He, he testifies to the demons and to the fallen angels what had happened, takes that victory, um, um, and, and, and takes control over us who believe, we now walk in victory, all right, um, because Jesus has uh, received the victory on the cross. And then he went to Abraham's bosom. This is where they were at in hell waiting for atonement. And he preached to them what had happened, and then they all went up to heaven. So prior to Jesus being resurrected, nobody was in heaven. Nobody. All right, they were in Abraham's bosom, which is a place in hell. Um, um, except for two individuals, Elijah and, and Enoch. Um, they, walked, they, were, they were on this earth and then they walked with God. But everybody else was in Abraham's bosom, all right? So why is that important? It's important because it shows that sin had to be dealt with once and for all. Because all the people that were there under the law from Moses forward, all those individuals, sacrifices were made once a year to pay for their sins through bulls and goats. But those sin sacrifices were only good for one year. That blood only covered their sin for one year. It still had to be atoned for. And the way it was atoned for was when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Because that sacrifice was good forever. For all sin, past, present, and future. We no longer enter through the blood of bulls and goats, is what the Word of God says. We now enter through the Messiah, the spotless Lamb, and we have full access to the throne of God because of it. All right? He made peace with God the Father. The enmity between God and man because of sin was satisfied. God the Father's not mad at us anymore. He ain't even a little bit upset at us. That price has been paid by Jesus Christ. And now we have access to God the Father. That's how we can boldly enter into the throne room of God and make our request when we pray. That doesn't mean we barge in and say, God, you have to give this to me. It means we go in knowing that we've been restored, like when a child runs to his father and cries out, Abba, Father, and jumps in his daddy's hand. Arms, well, Abba, Father means daddy, daddy, and jumps in his dad. So we have that kind of relationship now as children of God. Uh, and you must... Take or receive the gift that was given today in order to be born again. We are under the age of grace. The sacrifice has been made. And if you don't lay hold of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you, you must be born again. If you are not born again, you have not accepted or received this free gift from God, then you don't go to heaven. You don't go to heaven. So let's talk about that for a minute. So how do I lay hold of this gift? You must be born again. Jesus makes that very clear in John 3, 3. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now we give Pharisees a hard time, and, and, and we really, you know, Jesus called them a brood of vipers and everything, but there were some Pharisees who got it. There were some Pharisees who believed. Nicodemus is one of them. Paul was one of them. Joseph of, of Arimathea was one of them. 
So all these individuals, they were Pharisees and on the Sanhedrin rolling council, uh, and, and they believed, they believed in Jesus. So not all Pharisees were bad. Some believed, all right? So uh, Nicodemus is one of them. Verse two, he comes to Jesus at night and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. How does he know? Because of the evidence. Listen to what he says. For no one can perform the signs you are doing if God is not with them. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You must be born again. You must be born of spirit. And Jesus goes on to explain what that means. And he says that, that um, there are two kinds of birth. There's a birth that's given through water, and that's a natural birth when you're born. A woman's water breaks, and then you are birthed through water. And then there's a spiritual birth. Now, I know there are, are denominations that teach, and you may have been raised in one of them, I was, that that water birth is baptism. Word of God's very clear. You do not need to be baptized to be born again. You do not need to be baptized to be saved. You're commanded to be baptized, but it's not a requirement for salvation, all right? What's a requirement for salvation is to believe, to believe, and in particular, to believe in the resurrection. We're gonna to get to that in a second. So, you must be born again. And to be born again means to be born of the Spirit. And what, what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here is, you have to lay hold of salvation and have this new birth where Jesus comes into your heart that's receiving the gift and he takes your heart of stone and he gives you a heart of flesh that's moldable and pliable now, a living heart. And then he takes your dead spirit and he gives you a spirit that's alive, a totally new spirit, totally new spirit that's alive. And that's what it means to be born again. You're given this new spirit and your dead spirit is gone. Your spirit's dead because of original sin. And you are born with original sin in a spirit that is dead. All right? A living, eternal spirit will be with God forever. And that's the spirit that Jesus gives you. You see, here's the way it works. A lost person or a mortal person is born once. You're born of water, of women. All right? So you're born a natural birth. And they die twice. You die, this body dies, and then your spirit dies. When does your spirit die? It's already dead, but you're going to stand before Jesus and be judged. And because you didn't lay hold of this gift, you're going to be thrown in hell. And then at the great white throne of judgment, you're going to, at the resurrection of the dead, this is the second resurrection. It's called the resurrection of the dead. You're going to stand before Jesus and you are going to be judged on your life and you are going to be found guilty because he is a just judge. And then you're going to be thrown in the lake of fire, which is the second death. The lake of fire is the second death. All right? So that's the second death. All right? But those who are born again, and this is the good news, you're born twice and you only die once. You're born twice and you only die once. You're born the first time when you're born through water, through, through your mother, and then you're born the second time when you're born again, and the spirit of Christ comes in and gives you a new spirit. That's the second birth. And because of that, you only die once. Only this mortal body dies. Everybody's got to die to go to heaven. And this mortal body is going to die. But you never suffer a second death because the great white throne of judgment is not for born again believers. It's only for those who were dead and died in Christ when they were dead. All right? They weren't born again. All right? Everybody else who's born again will live forever in the spirit. So that's the good news of the gospel. Amen? All right, so most Americans, the overwhelming majority of the Amer Americans say they're Christians. They say they're Christians. And they walk around with their cross on or, or maybe their, their cross tattoo on their body or their Jesus shirts on and they say they're born again. But there's not a real lot of evidence that they're born again. You see, because it's more than knowing about Jesus, it's more than saying you know Jesus. You gotta have this experience where you give your heart to Jesus and you become born again. And we, we learn that and you believe not only in him but in the resurrection. And we learn that from Romans 10, 9, and 10. So turn with me to Romans 10, 9, and 10.
And this is the key to it all. God wants your heart. God wants your heart. He wants all of you. He wants you all in. And Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's the confession part. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. But there's an and here. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. You must believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. That's the requirement. You have to believe in the resurrection. And you have to understand that that resurrection proves that Jesus paid the price, that he was a sufficient sacrifice. So you have to believe in the resurrection. Verse 10, for it is with, so, so let me recap this. What must you believe? You must believe God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, it's not enough to just believe in Jesus because even the demons believe in Jesus. Even the fallen angels believe in Jesus. Plenty of heathens are walking around and they believe Jesus lived. They believed he was a prophet. They may even believe that, that he did miracles and signs and wonders. But that's not enough. You have to believe in the resurrection. In the resurrection. And that that price was paid. See, it's not even enough to believe that he died for your sins. I know that's hard for some of you to, to get. But right here, it doesn't say you're saved because you believe he died for your sins. It says you're saved because you believe in the resurrection. And you understand that death for your sin was an atoning sacrifice. And it finished it once and for all. And he was raised to new life. That's the key. You have to believe in that. And it's not even good enough to believe that if you said this simple prayer, you get to go to heaven. And to give them lip service, the first part, to declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and say, I said that prayer, so I get to go to heaven. You don't get to pray and get to go to heaven. You got to believe that God raised them from the dead. And that's a problem. Most of the people out there have been whipped up into an emotional frenzy, came to the altar all full of snot and goo, and said to, to themselves, I'm no good, and cried all over the altar, and then gave God lip service. You didn't believe, your heart didn't change. It was an emotional thing. Your heart didn't change. And then you walked out of the church and you thought you were born again, and all of a sudden you get back into your life and all hell breaks loose in your life, and you say Christianity's too hard or this didn't stick or I don't know, it just must not have worked. And then you get born again, 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 and again. You keep trying to get born again. And the reason why you're not born again is because your heart has not changed. It is a heart issue. It's not a confession issue, it is a heart issue. Your heart must change. And Paul makes it very clear right here. He makes it very clear. And he goes on to say in verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. You see, justification comes through heart belief. Some theologians call this progressive, or sorry, positional righteousness. Positional righteousness. You're made just or righteous because you believe, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did. And because Jesus was that all-sufficient sacrifice that was resurrected. And because he was resurrected, you are now clothed or literally covered in his righteousness. That is positional righteousness or justification. And we all know the little ditty that says justification means it's just as if you never sinned. Not because of anything you did, because of what Jesus did. So you are covered in his righteousness. And that's called justification. You are made just because you believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then the next part says, and with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So once that occurs, when you profess then that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that's when salvation is, the total package of salvation occurs. And then you become a witness to what had happened. And you can't help but tell people about what God is doing in your life and how you have changed. That's the part most people are missing. So, that is what salvation is. It, it, it's believing that Jesus' sacrifice fully atoned for all of your sins, past, present, and future. And that through that belief and belief in the resurrection, you are born again. 
So I started this all out with telling you, you can know that you know that you know that you are born again. So I'm going to wrap it all up with how do I know that I'm born again? How do I know? And this is Assembly of God doctrine. We have a very small doctrine, only about eight pages, if it's printed out, of what, what are the 16 fundamental truths and what you must believe if you're part of the Assembly of God. And this is one of the fundamental truths. It's a part of one of the fundamental truths. It's the blessed assurance that you can know that you know that you are born again. You shouldn't be wandering around going, I hope so, I think I am, I believe it's stuck, I guess I'm born again, I said that prayer, so I guess I'm covered, uh, uh, and, and I should be okay. You can know. How do you know? There is evidence of salvation that's given to you by God, so that you're walking around without doubt. All right? There's two evidences primary. There's the inward evidence and the outward evidence. The inward evidence and the outward evidence. The inward evidence is the direct witness of the Holy Spirit. God talks to you. God talks to you. And you know he exists because you have a conversation with him. Probably every day if you're truly born again. God talks to you. Romans 8.16. The, the Spirit himself testifies. This is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself testified with our spirit that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit confirms that you are a child of God. And that's what happens when you become born again. You get adopted into God's family and become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You become a son or daughter of God. And the Holy Spirit bears witness and testifies to you of that. The second way is in John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep listen or hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Jesus talks to you, gives you direction in your life. You hear you hear clearly, and you follow that direction. He speaks to you. Verse 28. I give them everlasting life, and they shall never perish, nor, sorry, they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. This is the scripture that all those people who believe once saved, always saved, point to, and say, see, once you're saved, you're good to go. It doesn't matter how you live your life. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what kind of a heathen you are. You're covered by grace. You can go live and be the same heathen you were before. And it doesn't matter because you cannot lose your salvation. Absolutely not. The word of God clearly states you can lose your salvation over and over and over again. Someday I'll preach on that. It's throughout the New Testament that you can be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. This scripture is talking about no one will snatch them out of my hand. And that is true. Satan ain't going to snatch you out of Jesus' hand. The demons aren't going to snatch you out of his hand. The government isn't going to snatch you out of his hand. A lousy pastor isn't going to snatch you out of his hand. False witnesses aren't going to snatch you out of his hand. And the heathen people that are trying to draw you away are not going to snatch you out of his hand. No one will except you. Except you. See, because God gave you free will. And the moment you get born again, that free will is not negated. Free will is how a third of the angels in heaven turned their back on God and rebelled against him. A third of the angels who sat there and saw him every day rebel. That's how powerful free will is. And God's will cannot subvert your free will or cannot override your free will. And you can freely turn your back on him and walk away from it. And people do it every day. Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you knew the Lord at one time. Maybe you were born again. Maybe you were plugged into the church. You had a great relationship with God. You were serving. You were growing. You were being discipled. And all of a sudden you became like that seed that was choked out by the thorns and thistles. Or that seed that the sun dried up and scorched and died. Because you turned your back on God. You let the cares of the world consume you. You let this world overtake you. You start hanging out with bad company and it corrupted you. Maybe that's you. The good news is you can run back into his arms. You can run back into his arms. But, but be perfectly clear and understand you snatched yourself out of God's hands and you can snatch yourself out of God's hands. So back to this inward evidence. That was a little side trip there. I want to get back to this inward evidence. God speaks to you. Now, I tell people all the time, God talked to me this morning, or I heard from God when I was praying and walking the dog, or, you know, God came to me and spoke to me or gave me something in the night, or, or somehow God spoke to me. 
And they look at me and go, what do you mean God speaks to you? These are believers. And they say, what do you mean? I've never heard from God. I've never heard from God. That's check number one. You better check yourself. Because the word of God is very clear. And I've already given you scriptures to prove he speaks to you. So let me give you some tangible ways he speaks to you. Because maybe you're just not recognizing. Maybe you're not recognizing when he speaks to you. Number one is an audible voice. If you hear the voice of God, he's trying to grab hold of you. I've never heard the voice of God. There are people who have heard audible voices. I know some of them. In almost every instance when they've heard an audible voice from God, there was some type of imminent danger and God spoke to them or something major was going on and, and, and God was grabbing a hold of them and he spoke audibly to them. That's very rare. I can count on probably one hand the amount of people who heard the direct voice of God, but it happens. So I want you to be aware of it. God can be speaking to you directly. The second way is through the unction of the Holy Spirit. This is the most common. This is the inward witness, the Holy Spirit bearing witness with your spirit because you have a born again spirit now that's alive and the Holy Spirit's in you. He's speaking to your witness, he's speaking to your spirit and it's bearing witness that you're a child of God and he's giving you direction and telling you to do things and leading your life and opening doors for you and nudging you to walk through them, telling you to pray for people, telling you to go over and meet a need for someone or speak to somebody. That's that inward unction. That's the most common uh, way you hear the voice of God. The next way is through his word. And that's when, when you're reading the Bible, which is the word of God. And that word goes from logos, and, and Jesus is the word. It goes from that Jesus word to rain, direct revelation. And you'll read a scripture and God will speak to your heart through that scripture. You may have read it 10 times before, or 100 times before. And all of a sudden you read it and it's dealing with something in your life and God uses it to speak directly to you because the word of God is alive. It's a spiritual book. And when you read it in the spirit, it bears witness to your spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that book becomes alive and speaks to you. Matter of fact, it says if you're trying to read it out of head knowledge, if you're not born again and you're reading the word of God, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. And that happens all the time with people I run into. They say, I don't understand it. I don't get it. It's because they're reading it with this. It's they're reading it with this. You got to read it with your heart. You got to read it with that born again spirit. And then it becomes Raymond comes alive. That's the third way. The fourth way is through dreams and visions. Dreams and visions. Now this one you got to be careful because there's some weird people out there that are just dreaming, vision, and everything. You got to make sure it's from God. And you got to know when God is speaking to you. All right? This is clearly laid out. It is biblical. It's in Acts 2.17. It's also in Joel uh, 2.28. Joel 2.28 is the prophecy about it. Acts 2.17 is when Peter comes out and preaches one of the best messages ever preached in the history of the world in the day of Pentecost. And he's telling all the people there that this is what the prophet Joel was speaking about. And he says that God's spirit will be poured out on my people. My sons and daughters, that's, that's us, will prophesy. The old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. So those things will go on in the end times when we get into this New Testament covenant. This is going to happen. God's Spirit's going to be poured out on all mankind. That's why we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because God's Spirit is poured out on us and he gives us giftings. And part of those giftings deal with dreams and visions and, and the ability to see things and prophecy. And, and our sons and daughters prophesy. And these are all ways we can hear from God. There are biblical ways we hear from God. So he can give, come to you in a dream or he can give you something in a dream. You can have a closed-eyed vision or an open-eyed vision. Um, and and um, people can prophesy it over you and testify to you. And then the last way is through other people. And this is one that always cracks me up because God will be speaking something to me. He'll be talking to me through the inward witness or through his word and bringing confirmation. And all of a sudden, three or four other believers I know, good, strong, godly men and women, will speak to me the exact same thing. They'll tell me the exact same thing. And it's like, hmm, I wonder if God's trying to say something. See, the world co co chalks that up to, to coincidence. Huh, isn't that a coincidence? It isn't a coincidence. God's bringing confirmation to you that he's speaking to you, especially when it lines right up with what he's dealing with you about or what you're hearing from him. 
and he'll bring that testimony. That's people operating in the gifts of the spirit with words of wisdom or words of knowledge or prophecy, bringing, bringing confirmation to what's been told to you. So that's the fifth way that you can hear from God. So there's five ways that you clearly hear from God and he should be speaking to you every day, every day. Then the second way you know that you are born again is the outward evidence. A life of righteousness and holiness. You must change. This is the becoming a new creation. Your life must change. As you get plugged in and you're discipled, you have to change. Hopefully you go to a church that disciples, because there's a lot of them out that don't. They're just religious churches and they don't teach the word of God. They don't preach the word of God. People don't plug in and get discipled. Hopefully you go to a church where you're discipled so that you can become a discipler and you can disciple other people. You must change. And if you're not changing, if you're the same person, you, you may have said this prayer and you thought you were born again, you bought some fire insurance and you think you're covered, but you look at your life over the last five or 10 or 15 years and you're basically the same person doing the same things and your life has not changed at all, you better check yourself because you have to change. You are gonna be molded and formed into the image of Jesus Christ. You are gonna become Christ-like and you are going to look like Jesus so that you can reflect him to the rest of the world. So if you're the same old sinner, you're just an old sinner saved by grace and you're the same old person, you're probably not born again. You're probably not born again. So let's take a look at this. Ephesians 4, 24, Ephesians 4, 24. You were taught with regard to your former ways to put off your old self. Stop being a sinner. Now he wouldn't tell you that if he didn't give you the ability to do it. Stop being a sinner, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, that's sin, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. Renew your mind. Be discipled and understand what it means to be a Christian. We renew our mind through the word of God. And we understand what it means to be Christ-like and how to reflect Jesus to the world. 24. And to put on your new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's progressive righteousness. So we have positional righteousness, which is we're covered in the blood of Jesus, we're covered in his righteousness, and when God looks at us, he sees his son and sees us as righteous or justified. And then there's this progressive righteousness or sanctification, sanctification. And this is being molded and formed into the image of Jesus Christ, becoming Christ-like. And if you are born again, you shouldn't be that same old sinner. You should be changing and running your race and becoming more and more Christ-like, completing the works that he laid out for you in advance to do. And you should be becoming like Jesus and reflecting him in everything that you do to the world. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. 1 Peter 5, 15 repeats that. Be holy as he is holy. He is holy and we are called to walk in holiness. And then Titus 2, 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. All people. God's desire is that all would be saved. Verse 12. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Say no to this world. Say no to the flesh. Say no to our emotions, our will, and our mind. To live in the spirit. And to self-control. And to live in self-control. Upright and godly lives in this present age. Not when we come back, not when we have our glorified, resurrected bodies, the moment we are born again. And to live control, self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You must change. You must change. So if you're not hearing from God and you're not changing, you better check yourself. You better have a real conversation with yourself and, and, and reach out to God, cry out to him. Give your heart to him and believe in the resurrection because the resurrection is key to everything. So let me wrap this all up. Are you religious or are you in relationship? 
a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you given your heart to him? Has the spirit of Christ came into you and taken that old self and given you a new spirit and a new heart? Because the word of God says he will. Has your heart been changed and do you believe in the resurrection? Believe in the resurrection. That's where justification comes. Believing in the resurrection. Is there evidence in your life that you are born again? Guys, some of you got to have a hard conversation with yourself today. There's no better day than Easter Sunday. There's no better day than Resurrection Sunday to have that hard conversation. Am I truly born again? And is that undeniable evidence in my life? Does God talk to me and speak to me? Do I hear the voice of God? Is he guiding my footsteps and guiding my life? Do I hear from him? And number two, am I changing? Do I look totally different than I did when I got born again 20 years ago? Or 10 years ago? Or five years ago? Or a year ago? Or six months ago? If you're truly born again, you should look different. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey. It's running your race. It's working out your, your faith with fear and trembling. It's being discipled and being molded slowly into the image of Jesus Christ. And as God deals with you, you start to deal with the sin of your life. It's like peeling away the layers of an onion. And you're slowly peeling all those layers away as you draw closer and closer to Jesus Christ. That's called sanctification or progressive righteousness. Is your life changing? Are you born again? And are you being discipled? Hopefully, if you're not, you'll make you'll lay hold of that salvation today. You'll make some time to get with Jesus during the course of the day, and you'll ask him to come into your heart truly this time. You'll understand the importance of the resurrection in the scriptures I review. And you'll truly believe that he is resurrected, he is alive. And you'll lay hold of that gift that he has for you. And then get plugged into a good Bible teaching church and be discipled. Understand and know the word of God. And be discipled so you can start discipling other people. It's Resurrection Sunday. And I just pray, I pray that we all know who Jesus is. And that we all get to go home and be with him. And that we all spend eternity with him. He's given us this great, precious gift. Lay hold of it today. Open it up. The gift's there. It's already been wrapped up and the bow's been put on. All the work has been done by him. We don't need to do any work. It's all been done by him. And salvation is there waiting for us. All we have to do is lay hold of Jesus. It's there. Believe in him and believe in the resurrection today. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for that work that was done on the cross, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that, that, that through your blood, it's all been paid for once and for all, Lord. Eternal. Lord, that every sin has been dealt with, past, present, and future. And the Lord, we can lay hold of this free gift because of what you've done on the cross and because the resurrection, the first fruits, of eternal life are there to prove that God accepted that sacrifice. That enmity between God, the Father, and man has been dealt with once and for all. And that through you, Lord, we can boldly enter into the throne room of God and say, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. He sees us as joint heirs with you now. We're all his children, brothers and sisters. And Jesus, we thank you for everything you're doing in our lives. Lord, we just pray that as we celebrate the resurrection today, that we would be focused on you, that we would have some deep conversations with our spouses, with our loved ones, with our children. We gather around the dinner table today that we would stay focused on you, Lord, and that we would understand what a precious gift you gave to us this day, and that we would understand how to be truly born again. Lord, help those two proofs to manifest in our lives. Help us to see it and know that we know that we know we are born again. Help us, Lord, to have that kind of relationship where you speak to us daily. 
where you're with us and we know that you're with us and we can lay hold of you at any time. Help us, Lord, to be born again. I just pray for all these things in Jesus' name. And if that's you, if you have that kind of relationship, tell somebody about how good Jesus is today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. AJ's going to play us out, and I want you to just spend a little bit of time thinking about, thinking about the message today. on you for the rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, folks, this is going to conclude service uh, this morning. Uh, I'm not, we're not going to end the broadcast just yet because I would like to try to figure out a little more about uh, the sound issues that we had earlier. Again, I apologize for that. Uh, it seems to be a, a issue on the Facebook side of things, not on our side of things. However, it is something that I think I can, I can fix. Um, so I, I need to do some um, exploring on that regard. So the, the service is over. I'm going to keep the broadcast open just so I can see things in real time. Um, so I hope you all have a blessed day. And um, yeah, the, the <laughs> don't don't mind me while I while I try to figure this out. All right. Because I can't shut it off, and I have to see the live stream because. Do you have a chance to just do another live stream, then we can delete it. Yeah, because then everybody's a notification of a live. I might as well just keep us up and just leave. Um, so here's what happened. Whenever we unplugged the microphone, well, not when we unplugged it, whenever the microphone came unplugged, it threw Facebook all through a loop. Um, I don't know what happened, but uh, all of a sudden the, the connections like stopped working and it started skipping and like cutting in and out, and it, it was it was that was weird. Um, Basically, like the sound. We bump whenever we were moving it. So here's the th here's the thing, we cannot we cannot be moving the microphone back and forth. Um, we can't uh, we can't move the microphone back and forth because if it come on, comes unplugged up here, then we have an issue. So essentially, um, it got unplugged from there, and then Facebook freaked out because it didn't know where the sound was coming. I guess, but it, it also caused a connection issue, and I don't know why it did that. So what I want to figure out is. Um, if 
Hold on. If I talk, I can't think. If. Okay, so now it's coming through the microphone. Now, if I unplug this. So it's still working. And then if I plug this back in. Now what? Is it working now? Now it's still working. Okay. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I know. Okay. Yeah, it, it is a Facebook thing because every, everything's working. No, I, I would I would pick up on that. Yeah, the less fumbling around, the better. Yeah, we can end it.